morning. Welcome to Spark and AI Summit. Um, to kick off the conference, I want to tell you the story of Luster. And this is almost about a decade ago. It was a very special year, 2008, 2009, for uh, Luster. Luster back then was a PhD student at the UC Berkeley AMB Lab researching large-scale distributed machine learning. And um, around then, Netflix started this Netflix price. How many of you have actually heard of or remember Netflix price? A lot of you. So Netflix anonymized all their moving rating data sets by their users and actually started the competition. And the goal of the competition is for the participants to actually come up with the best recommendation algorithms. And whoever could do that would win a million dollars. A million dollars is a lot of money for Lester, who was a poor PhD student, so he jumped on it. And he actually started looking at ways of prototyping machine learning algorithms and different models um, to scale out beyond his single neural laptop. And he couldn't actually find very good solutions back then. So he walked down the aisle at the UC Berkeley AMP Lab and actually talked to the other guy, Matei Zaharia, who we all know today as the very original creator of the uh, Apache Spark project. He talked to Matei and said, I think if you were to give me a few different system primitives and build this specific system, I could actually use it to complete my task. And this is how Spark was created. A weekend later, 600 lines of code, the first version of Spark was born. It was actually the first unified analytics engine that you could use to combine um, big data processing. So a lot of the feature engineering work is required, and model prepping, and model training, and model inference. So it's the first system that actually combined both. Right. This is what the event that actually led to the creation of Spark. What about Lester? So Lester was actually part of this team called the Ensemble Team, and this is the original leaderboard for Netflix Prize. As you can see from the uh, leaderboard, the ensemble team actually came up with the best recommendation algorithm tied with another team called Belcourt's Pragmatic Chaos. But unfortunately, the ensemble team submitted the entry 20 minutes late and actually lost a million dollars. And here's the picture of the other team happily accepting the million dollar check. The story of Lester doesn't just end there, though. Um, Lester, this day, Lester is actually a faculty member at Stanford University, so life's uh, worked out fine for him. And really, look at where we are today. Um, all of you are actually here to celebrate Spark and AI. Um, in the next few minutes, I want to review with you some of the recent history of how Spark has evolved. And you actually see this whole process, the history of Spark, is a process of reinventing itself. Right? And the way I'm going to do this is I'll show you screenshots of the actual slides I personally have presented over the past few years. So if actually one of the screens says, this is coming soon, it meant it was coming soon, say, three or four years ago. It doesn't mean it's actually coming through now. Right? Um, first, 2014, we actually released Apache Spark 1.0. That was actually a pretty important event. And the very special thing with Spark's 1.0 release is on top of the core engine, there's actually a number of domain-specific libraries that's pre-built. The libraries were baked in, so the users can actually use the functionalities at their fingertips. This substantially improved the productivity of the users because they no longer need to code every single algorithm by hand themselves. The year later, we actually started a massive work to introduce a whole brand new API called the DataFrame API that these days most of the Spark users are using. So they shifted from the original RDD API to DataFrame API. And the DataFrame API also enabled a lot of new optimizations, such as the Tungsten Execution Engine, which is a whole rewrite of the execution engine. It's kind of laid down the foundation of Spark's evolution in the next few years. And just shortly a year later, we started this effort called Structured Streaming, which builds on the DataFrame API and unifies streaming and batch. So it's a single API, DataFrame, that can support both streaming analytics and batch analytics running on the same engine. And another year later, just last year, 2017, a whole new execution mode for Structured Streaming called Continuous Processing was introduced. And continuous processing cuts down the latency, the end-to-end -end latency of data going to Spark and going out of Spark to sub-milliseconds. There's no more micro-batch. Right? And today, I'm very happy to announce, just on the Databricks platform alone, structured streaming has processed, in 2018, 100 trillion records. It's 100 trillion records that's processed just on Databricks alone. So if you were to count the actual numbers of all the Spark deployments out there, it's going to be a hell of a lot higher than this. This is sort of somehow Spark has evolved technically, but one of the major historic events in terms of building the Spark community, I think, was this. 
In September 2015, Derek Harris of the Fortune magazine actually wrote, Apache Spark is the Taylor Swift the, uh, of big data software. So I thought it was pretty cool. I've been doing all this technical work. They're always very difficult for me to explain to my friends what I actually do. And now with this, I could show them this slide. Um, I started using this slide actually quite a lot um, around 2016. And there, I think it was one talk I gave um, in Japan. It was a very long technical talk. It was about an hour. So I went through a number of different important technical topics, deep dives. And at the end of the talk, I asked the audience, so do you have, guys have any questions? And the engineers in the room was pretty shy. Nobody put up their hands. I had to encourage them again, ask them, do you have any questions? And finally, one question. It was the only question anybody has asked that day in a room of like 500 people. And the question was, so what does Derek mean that Apache Spark is a Taylor Swift of uh, big data software? <laughs> and I was like, OK, out of all the questions I just, or out of all the topics I just went through, this is the only question you could ask. But I actually don't know the answer to that question. So I actually emailed Derek. And uh, he got back to me and said, the reason I actually called it the uh, Taylor Swift of uh, big data software was because Spark came out of nowhere, within a couple of years, rose to prominence, and actually became ubiquitous. Very similar to how Taylor Swift's uh, personal career has uh, grown. All right. So enough about history and Taylor Swift. Let's talk about the future and what's coming next. In the past couple of years, there's very, one very interesting trend that's happened in the machine learning side, which is we have seen an explosion of machine learning frameworks, in particular driven by a lot of the deep learning work that's happening. Spark MLlib itself is one of the distributed um, training frameworks, but there's also TensorFlow, MXNet, PyTorch, a lot of uh, what you've uh, um, already heard of. And Spark's goal is really to create a unified engine that could combine both big data prep, feature engineering, and model training and model inference. In order for, to realize this goal, it is important for Spark to actually embrace all of the systems as first class um, uh, support citizens. So we looked at this, and we actually found two very important technical challenges in order to realize that goal, to support all the machine learning frameworks um, efficiently. The first is data exchange, and the second is execution mode. So in data exchange, it is important for Spark to be able to push data in high throughput to these frameworks. And the latter, it is important for Spark to understand how these frameworks are actually executed so Spark could support them. And Project Hydrogen is the latest effort in Spark to actually combine and solve these two specific um, challenges. All right, in order to explain this, I have to sort of take a look under the hood of how Spark actually works in order to explain to you that technical problems and how we plan to solve them. Let's start with data exchange. Spark and a lot of other systems have this concept of user-defined functions. And a user-defined function, time, sometimes called UDF, is the primary way for users to execute arbitrary code. So this is any code you want. Spark supports many different languages, Scala, Python, R, and all of that. And it's actually very, the most common way to integrate with machine learning frameworks in Spark, because now you can actually define a snippet of code that actually calls some specific libraries. And one simple example is I could be using a user-defined function to call, um, to call into TensorFlow and do prediction on a specific data set. The, um, this is how actually UDFs um, are executed in Spark. And just imagine I have the Spark process and have a UDF, this very simple UDF that says x plus 1. So all it does is increment a number by 1, and it's returned in this specific case in Python. And I have data that's coming in. In this case, only three rows, very simple. And then um, the query or the uh, data pipeline is supposed to increment the very first column by 1 for every single row. And the way we execute it is called row at a time execution. This is how it actually currently works. Spark will read in the very first row. And on this Spark understands the format of the row. It spits it off um, for the parts it doesn't um, need for the input for the UDF. It will actually send it directly downstream. And for the parts that required for the UD, uh, input of the UDF, Spark will send it to the Python process. And the Python process gets the number one and will actually increment it in Python and then increment it to 2, and then actually send it back to Spark. And Spark will now join the uh, um, number 2 with the rest of the row, and actually emits the second, uh, emits the output. All right. Conceptually, very simple. This is probably like a few thousand lines of code supporting all of this, but it's conceptually very simple. Now, and Spark will just continue working down the um, table to actually process the second row and the third row, and that's how Spark emits all the results and executes this UDF. 
Now, while this is conceptually very simple, the challenge with it is if you were to profile it, and we did this, um, you realize the performance was really, really bad. As a matter of fact, in this case, um, Spark was able to process with this UDF 8 megabytes per second. And once you profile it, 92% of the time are spent in just exchanging data. So Spark sending data to Python, Python sending the data back to Spark. 92% of the time just wasting. They're not actually effective work. All right. It's an enormous amount of inefficiency there. In order to actually solve this problem, to be able to actually push data and substantially improve the efficiency, we introduced a new way of doing this called vectorized data exchange. And in vectorized data exchange, rather than we send data row by row, so instead of row at a time to Spark, we would actually send data a whole batch at a time in a columnar format. So in this case, have the data encoded in a columnar format, and the Spark would actually read in the entire block of data, split it off into different columns, send the very first column, which is all the integers, to Python. And on the Python side, very likely when you write one plus, uh, x plus 1, because the data that's got sent from Spark to Python is actually now a NumPy array or a Panda series, it will actually invoke the uh, vectorized operation that's actually behind the scene, even though you're writing a Python UDF. Um, it's behind the scene implementing C++ in native code. It's vectorized also. And they will actually increment the entire block, the entire vector, by one, and then send it back to Spark. And now Spark reassembles it back and actually sends it downstream again in the vectorized uh, columnar format. And this is actually much more efficient. How much more? It depends exactly on what you do, because you, get, you gain efficiency by through a faster sort of data exchange, but you also gain efficiency through better vectorized execution on the Python side. So we actually tested with three different examples. The first one is a very simple one, plus one. Just increment everything by one. The second is cumulative distributed uh, function. And the sec uh, third is subtract mean. You can actually see you gain massive speed ups, especially for the more complicated functions. And for the simplest one we came up with, it was a 3x speed up. For the more complicated one, we got 240 times. This is a massive speed up you would get. And this is the kind of uh, performance you would actually need to power the machine learning frameworks. So the second part is execution model. And same thing in order to do that, I have to explain to you how Spark execution model actually works um, under the hood first. So Spark um, it employs this way we call the embarrassingly parallel model of execution. It's massively scalable. And in this case, Spark actually assumes that different tasks um, in a job is independent of each other. So they don't have to communicate with each other. There's no dependency. This is the easiest way to actually scale systems to thousands of machines. But most of the distributed machine learning framework actually assumes a very different model of execution. They assume dependency and this constant communication between the machine learning models because in order to train a model, it requires very high throughput and high bandwidth communication. And these two models, at a high level, seems fine. But actually, they have a fundamental conflict when one of the tasks crashes. Because you want your system to be fault tolerant, you want the system to be able to recover when anything fails. In the case of Spark, if one of the tasks crashes, Spark just rerun that specific task because there's no dependency. In the case of the distributed machine learning frameworks, because the machine learning frameworks, the different executor modes actually depend on each other, there's dependency between them, you can't just relaunch one of the tasks. All the tasks have to relaunch. Otherwise, the task will just hang there and wait for the other task to come up. So the second part of Project Hydrogen is the introduction of this new barrier mode of execution, which is a new API that user can specify and tell to Spark, chop off this job into different stages. And for one of the stages in the middle that label them as barrier, use a new execution scheduling mode called gang scheduling to schedule the task either all or nothing. Right? You either launch all of the tasks at the same time or launch none of the tasks, because just launching one would actually break the machine learning system. And this is actually what's needed to make um, the machine learning systems fault tolerant running directly on top of Spark. So Project Hydrogen has two parts, just to summarize. The first part is to get to 10 to 100x faster data exchange. And the second part is to unify the execution scheduling mode of Spark and the machine learning frameworks. 
Um, to give you a little bit of a timeline, this work has actually started um, almost a year ago. The in Spark 2.3 was actually shipped um, earlier this year. There's already basic vectorized user defined function support. Um, you could, I also give you the Jira ticket number for you to look it up if you're interested in. Um, in Spark 2.4, which is going through release candidate uh, status right now, so it could come any day now, um, there's actually the introduction of the first barrier scheduling mode, um, as well as actually more vectorized UDF support. And very likely, um, next year, we'll actually introduce Spark 3.0, so the next major big version of Spark. And you mark the general availability of all the features I just talked about, as well as supporting actually much more different formats for data exchange. So this is Project Hydrogen. There's actually a lot more going on in the Apache Spark community. At any given release, there's over a 1,000 different changes. Um, I can't possibly cover all of them. There's actually a few different things I personally think is extremely exciting. They also encourage you to check them out. There's actually session talks about them. There's a Hydrogen talk. There's actually a Kubernetes talk um, for enabling Spark to run natively on Kubernetes. And there's also how eBay has migrated their Teradata instances over to Spark for their data warehouses. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>